All right, well, we're getting down to the end of our series on the 12 strong men. We're on the 11th one today, and that's the spirit of pride. But before we open the word, I'd like us to just uh, bow our heads. Father God, we thank you and praise you that uh, you are the essence of every good thing. And that includes humility, it includes love, it includes all the opposites of pride. And so, Lord, uh, we just pray you'll examine our hearts today and whatever things are there, including pride, that uh, you want to heal us of, we just pray, Lord, that you will uh, do that work because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of a man named Roger uh, <laughs> who was uh, reading his paper one day and uh, his great-grandson came home from school and uh, said, Papa, I need help. Uh, my teacher wants me to define the difference between irritation, aggravation, and frustration. And I don't know what to tell her. So Roger reluctantly put down his paper and he said, well, my boy, go over and get the house phone and bring it here and maybe I can help you. So uh, the boy brought the house phone over. Roger put it on speaker so he could hear it and he dialed a number at random. And uh, after several rings, a man answered on the other end and he said, hello, and in a very commanding voice, uh, Roger said, is Roger the Great there? The man said, there is no Roger here, great or otherwise, you've got the wrong number. Hung up the phone. Roger said, uh, that, my boy, is irritation. <laughs> then he went back to reading his paper for another minute or so, and then he took the same phone, called the same number again. After many rings, the same man came back. Who is this? Uh, is Roger the Great there? I told you there's no Roger here. What's wrong with you? I'm going to report you to the police for harassment if you call back again. Slam down the phone. That, my boy, is aggravation. Went back to reading his paper. He said, now go get me my cell phone over there on the table. And uh, the boy brought his cell phone over to him. And after about another minute, he put it on speaker. And in a different voice this time, he dialed the same number. The same man, after several rings, came to the phone, totally frustrated. Who is this? This is Roger the Great. Have there been any calls for me? <laughs> that, my boy, is frustration. Uh, so, I guess the moral of that story is don't interrupt Roger when he's reading his paper or else uh, a better moral might be that we're living in a world today where frustration comes very easily. There are so many things that can frustrate us. For example, how many of you have your name on the no call list for telemarketers? Okay, I see several hands. We do too. Now, how many of you get calls from telemarketers all the time, even though you still have your name on that list. Now, that's kind of a small frustration, but uh, it's still a frustration. Computers can be a real frustration. I, I just got a new laptop recently, and that thing has been causing me a lot of frustrations, trying to learn the difference with Windows 8 and all the touching, feeling stuff, and uh, it's... Uh, frustrated me on more than one occasion, but that's still a small frustration in the big scheme of things. Uh, uh, then there's driving on Southern California freeways. You know, if you drive 22,000 miles a year like I do, you get to see drama every day. Uh, no fail, even on the way to church this morning, I saw two cars just about smash and go crazy at each other. Uh, it happens almost every time you get out there on Southern California freeways. But the truth of the matter is that all of these frustrations are really very small time compared to what I hear regularly as a counselor and as a pastor. I'm hearing about frustrations of people losing loved ones, losing their health, 
losing their homes, losing their marriages. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about big time stuff here. People trying to find jobs and apply everywhere and they just can't get a job. Uh, people going bankrupt. I mean, these are frustrations of a fairly severe magnitude. So uh, the question that I want us to think about this morning is how many of you believe that God is the source of your frustrations? Is God frustrating you? That's the question I asked this morning. And according to his word, he does frustrate us. And it's directly related to the spirit that we're looking at this morning, which is in the King James Version called, I mean, yeah, in the King James, it's called a haughty spirit. But in the NIV, it's called the spirit of pride. And it's first talked about over in Proverbs 16, 18, which is on the front of your bulletin this morning. A uh, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall which brings up the old saying, pride goeth before a fall, which I'm sure you've all heard many times. But this morning I want us to think about the spirit of pride in the context of three points that I hope will be helpful as we apply them to our own lives. Number one, of the 12 strong men who harass and inhabit humanity, the spirit of pride is the most pervasive. This is the most pervasive of the 12 strong men. Pride is at the heart of innate sinful human nature. Over in 1 John 2.16, we're told that the worldly mind consists of three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Pride is at the very heart of sinful human nature. That's why Jeremiah says what he says in 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked because of pride. When Jesus talks about the human heart over in Mark 7.21, this is what he has to say. He says, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceitfulness, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, foolishness, and pride. All of these things are, are connected to pride. Pride is a very pervasive, powerful force in fallen man. The Bible speaks of sin as the mystery of iniquity. Why is it called a mystery? Because we have to ask, where did sin originate in a perfect environment where no one had a sinful nature? That's a mystery. And the best the Bible does to address it is over in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, where it talks about Lucifer saying, I will be like the Most High. I will build my throne above the heavens. Uh, Lucifer had pride. Pride was what gave birth to sin. So pride is a very powerful force. And, and pride is interconnected with selfishness. It's connected with stubbornness. It's connected with wanting our way. That's the way human beings are even when we come into the world. Even little kids have this tendency to want things their way. I looked up on YouTube, uh, I wrote in the question, definition of frustration. And this is what uh, it showed here. I don't know if Chuck can play this for us here. It's about a little 30 second spot.
<laughs> Even at the youngest of ages, uh, people experience frustration. They experience pride. They experience, I want things a certain way, and they're not going that way, as we see with this little kid. And when kids have this happen to them, they typically have what we call tantrums. You know, and hopefully as we get older, uh, we repress those tantrums, at least. And, uh, you know, so not too many adults are having outright tantrums, although some do. But if, if you're a pastor, you better not be having tantrums. I have seen, I've seen a few pastors who do that, and it's not a good scene. But, um, you know, if you could see what I grew up with, then you'd know that I had to repress a lot from uh, my childhood, from what I started out with uh, to becoming a pastor. And a lot of that was an Irish dad who had a real temper, and his Irish dad had even more of a temper. Um, if you know much about the Irish, you know they can have real tempers. And uh, my dad and my granddad were awesome examples of that. I was uh, eating lunch with my spiritual partner this week, and he uh, was telling me about one of his favorite programs, Duck Dynasty. And I, I'd read in the parade about Duck Dynasty, but I, I've never seen it on TV, and he was telling me, well, you ought to watch it. So I went on the internet and pulled down a, uh, one of the programs, I think it was called Till Duck Do Us Part, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, these, these characters are uh, mountain men types, and uh, it, they reminded me of my granddad, my dad's dad, um, except for these guys are more Christian than he was. But uh, as far as the mountain man part of it, that's totally where he was coming from. No one in my dad's family had been educated. He was the first one that went to college and stuff. But his dad was, you know, a hillbilly, worked as a logger up in the mountains, and, uh, you know, he was just a complete no-nonsense guy with, with a complete temper. Uh, you know, that's about the best you can describe it. And just to give you a few examples, when my dad was young, he decided to ditch school one day, to play hooky from school and just stay home. And uh, much to his chagrin, his parents came home earlier than he expected when he was there in the house, and he knew if he got caught playing hooky, his dad was going to beat him to a pulp. So he was scared to death, and uh, as they came into the downstairs, he went running in the upstairs to a closet to hide. But his dad heard him running. He heard the footsteps upstairs. So he started shouting out, who's up there? Who's up there? He thought there was a robber in the house or something. So he just takes a shotgun and starts shooting through the ceiling uh, in his own house, you know? That's, that's the kind of guy this guy was. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, he didn't hit my dad, but uh, another example, uh, correct me up, was uh, my dad had three sisters, and uh, they were Irish too, and especially the middle one. She was red-haired Irish. Uh, you'd have to know this woman to believe it, but uh, she was always getting in trouble, always causing my dad grief, and um, one day, uh, it came to such a point that he chased her up, in the, up to the top of this big wood pile in their backyard. It was out in the woods. And, and so he pours gasoline all the way around this wood pile as she's up there, you know, fighting with him. And he lights it on fire. So uh, his sister's just screaming at the top of her lungs. And, and uh, his dad, my dad's dad comes out and runs up there and saves her from the fire. And, uh, and then he lets the whole thing burn to the ground and makes my dad walk barefooted in the burning embers. <laughs> his feet are like totally scalded and stuff. I mean, that's just uh, kind of the hardcore stuff that uh, my dad grew up with. And um, so, you know, I've got an interesting history. Uh, my dad was like, he wasn't 20 when uh, he got engaged to my mom. Uh, they were at Walla Walla sophomore year, and uh, but they were planning on getting married when he turned 20. But my mom insisted that he had to be baptized first, which he wasn't really interested in. But it was what you call a shotgun baptism. 
he, he got baptized just so he could marry my mom the, the day before the wedding. And uh, so anyway, you know, my mom was saying, I never really knew how bad your dad's temper was till after we got married. And we went to Hawaii for our honeymoon. And uh, we were out in the middle of nowhere and the car broke down. And uh, your dad got out there and he started beating on that hood. And he, he's cussed every word I'd ever heard in my entire life, plus a whole new vocabulary I'd, I'd never even heard before. And uh, so he had this explosion of expletives that uh, he'd been repressing till after they were married. But uh, anyway, I, I grew up with that. I grew up with a dad who was totally into sports. And um, that's what he'd wanted to be. He wanted to be a major league ball player. And he was quite good. He'd, uh, been invited to the Cardinals training camp and he, he had some real potential and he also wanted to be a doctor that was his academic goal and so they're only married like two months and my mom gets pregnant and here they are sophomore <laughs> in college and uh, you know barely surviving anyway so all his dreams kind of got flushed down the toilet and um, you know he went into physical therapy which was still a good profession and stuff but barely made it through that with all the stress and strain that he had to deal with but um, you know here's a 20 year old dad with all these ridiculous stresses with the Irish temper and that's what I grew up with and uh, you know so I, I learned to be like about the most profane kid you can imagine even when I was just a little kid and uh, when I got older you know, I, I had the worst sailor mouth of all my friends and stuff. And uh, I can remember in the 10th grade uh, when I'd finally had kind of a spiritual awakening and I announced at the end of the 10th grade year when we were all asked to put in the, it was a 10th grade school, so we were asked to put what we were going to go into. And when I announced it was the ministry, all my friends started like falling over laughing and uh, <laughs> they, they just thought that was the biggest joke in, in history, that, uh, that this guy was going to go into the ministry. But, um, you know, I was thinking of that a few months ago when I was playing basketball at La Sierra, and uh, a lot of the college kids play, and, and uh, this one guy just got so mad, he went off into this just string of profanities, and then one of the other students said, don't you know who that is? He's a minister. He was our chaplain. And so the guy comes over and apologizes to me. And I said, hey, no, don't, don't apologize to me. My mouth was a lot worse than yours when I was younger. So, uh, you know, don't, don't do that to me. But uh, basically, pride takes many forms. And, and it's very pervasive. Uh, Temper is just one of the ways, you know. Pride is certainly related to anger, related to frustration, but it's related to almost everything in fallen human nature. Many people in our church have been abused. Many of us went through abusive experiences in one way or another. And uh, many times when a person's abused, you know, they, they'll have low self-esteem as a result of this. And many people kind of equate low self-esteem with humility but they're really not the same thing. Uh, humility is recognizing that every good thing comes from God, that God is the source of all good, and whatever gifts he's given us, they're to be used to his glory, not our own. That, that's what humility is about. Low self-esteem, on the other hand, can be self-hatred. Uh, many people who commit suicide, you know, obviously have low self-esteem. And, and low self-esteem can be very connected to pride. It can be a very selfish act. Most, most acts of suicide are acts of selfishness. There are so, some exceptions to that. But um, in other words, low self-esteem and humility are, are two totally different things. And as kingdom people, we want to be humble, but we don't want to have low self-esteem. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16 tells us who we are. Uh, Jesus says, can a mother forget her suckling child? She may forget, but I will never forget you because your, what? Your self-worth is engraved in the palms of my hands. Uh, our self-worth comes from how God sees us, from who we are in Christ, who we are in the blood of Christ, as Erlis was praying this morning. So, um, number one, uh, pride is a very pervasive thing. Number two, spiritual pride 
is rooted in rebellion against God and the need to be right. Spiritual pride is rooted in rebellion against God and the need to be right. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that rebellion against God has to consist of being openly opposed to him or fighting against him. That's certainly not the case. Uh, there are some people who actually do that. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Christopher Hitchens. He's considered one of the top 100 academics in the world. And he's written this book, God is Not Great, you know, which is a best-selling book. And, uh, you know, it just totally rips on God that... Uh, God's a joke and, you know, he's not real and it's all about being atheist and, and a secular mindset. That's, that's where the real health is if you're an atheist and a secularist. Uh, you know, and he's, he's making all kinds of fun of God, religion, faith, spirituality, etc. And, you know, he, he also makes some points that aren't uh, ridiculous. But anyway, um, the reality is that rebellion against God uh, can simply consist of being resistant to his spirit. That's the most common form of rebellion that we as Christians experience. And, um, you know, resistance of God's guidance, resistance of his direction, resistance to his voice, um, you know, resistance to just failing to listen, basically. Well, one of my favorite texts is Luke 8:18, 8, where Jesus says, be careful how you listen. For those who listen well will receive more, but those who fail to listen will lose even what they have. Uh, listening is a very important thing in the word of God. Listening is just as important a part of prayer as speaking to God is. And, uh, you know, we talked a few weeks ago about listening to God and some good books on how to hear God's voice and that kind of thing. But um, to be self-directed is to be in rebellion against God. Really, that's what it boils down to. If I'm choosing a self-directed life, I'm really choosing rebellion against God, even if I'm claiming to be a Christian, even if I'm a minister. Um, that's what I'm choosing, a self-directed life rather than a God-directed life. Uh, for 20 years, I was a university chaplain, and I did a lot of weddings over those 20 years, which also meant that I did a lot of marriage counseling. And I can remember one couple that uh, was one of my students who went into medicine and became a doctor, and then he, uh, you know, He'd actually been married to one girl that helped him get through med school and then divorced her, which was kind of a common pattern that often happened. And then he married his trophy wife, you know, after he got out of medicine and started making all this money and everything. And these two just fought continually. It was just ridiculous conflict. And I saw him on more than one occasion. And, uh, you know, it kind of reminded me of the old joke about the man who's just beating on the wall and says to his wife, you know, how could God make you so beautiful and so stupid at the same time? And she said, oh, that's easy, honey. He made me so beautiful so that you could love me and so stupid so I could love you. You know, that's, that's kind of what was going on with this couple. They were just constantly aggravating uh, each other. And, you know, because he treated her as a trophy wife, she didn't feel respected. And so then she just went out and spent all of his money irresponsibly. <laughs> and he hated that and felt disrespected. So, you know, the, the bottom line is that so much of marital conflict boils down to one thing. And that is that being right becomes more important than being in relationship. Being right is the focus rather than being in relationship. And uh, one of my favorite texts is over in Ecclesiastes. 716. It says, Be not righteous over much, neither make yourself overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? I first started loving this text when I was uh, at the seminary, and my favorite professor there, Eldon uh, Chalmers, used to talk about this text all the time. 
And he would often talk about it in connection with Adventism. This guy studied Adventism more than any other person I've ever known. He was a psychologist and his whole study was on the Adventist personality, how it related to other personalities. He was an expert in just about every personality test you can imagine. And, um, you know, he'd even studied Adventist ministers in great depth. So it was quite interesting to see how Adventists in general related to the general population, how Adventist ministers related to other ministers to the general population. But one of the things he came back to again and again was how Adventists have this thing about needing to be right. Um, you know, being right is such an important thing in the subculture. We're right. We're the remnant. We have the truth. Uh, and that carries over into marriages. It carries over into family life. And uh, he said, you know, it goes right back to the origins that the founders would never admit they were wrong about 1844. Everyone else in the Millerite movement admitted, hey, we screwed up, we made a mistake, but not the Adventists. They, they were the one group that said, no, we're right, we're going we're gonna to keep reinterpreting this to prove we were right, and we're never going to let go of that. And it involved all kinds of dishonesty to cover things up, and you know, the, the spirit of being right, spirit of pride, and spirit of dishonesty, you know, went together. And, and we, if we're former Adventists, can look at that and say, well, yeah, aren't we cooler than them, you know? But that, that's just pride itself. Um, obviously, the spirit of pride is this thing that says, well, we're more right than everybody else. And uh, denominations tend to be built on this. Um, again, it's just human nature to uh, fall into this kind of thing of needing to be right. And um, we need to keep coming back to love and relationship, Trump being right. There's only one who's right, because there's only one who's good. There's only one, the word righteous comes from the word right. And uh, there's only one who's right, there's only one who's righteous, there's only one who's good, and that's God. It's not us. And so we need to be learning to love. We need to be learning to grow in humility. We need to be getting those things from God and not thinking that we're right. Uh, because the more we think we're right, the more we give the spirit of pride a stronghold in us. And this strong man can be very vicious. The third and final point, the spirit of pride robs us of God's grace and results in every kind of frustration. That's what James 4, 6 is talking about. It says, God frustrates the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. I've meditated on that text a lot. I, I think mainly because my nature is to get easily frustrated. And uh, so I've thought about that text a lot. Uh, God frustrates the proud. Oh, I don't like that. Uh, the more I get frustrated, the more I have to conclude, hey, there's pride there. You're, you're getting frustrated because you got pride. And most of us don't like that. Um, I remember preaching on this at Celebration once, and uh, a mother, a single mother, came up to me afterwards, and she said, no, that just can't be true, Pastor. It cannot be true. Um, you know, I, I just don't believe that, uh, that I'm frustrated because I have pride. Uh, you know, try being a single mother. Uh, you won't have to have pride to get frustrated. And I, I think, you know, there's no question about the fact that there are stages of life that are much more difficult than others. When I, when I think back to when I was working full time, going to school a great deal, raising three kids, that was like the most ridiculous over, you know, just overwhelm. And uh, I, I can't compare my life right now, my stage of life, to what that was like. Uh, I don't even have close to the energy now to deal with what had to be dealt with at that stage of life. And um, you know what, when you think of single mothers in our culture, especially that have many kids, you know, it, it can be just absolutely overwhelming. I found something that I thought was kind of interesting. It says, you might be a frustrated mom if your feet stick to the kitchen floor and you don't care. <laughs> Two or nine, when the kids fight, you threaten to lock them in the same room and not let them out till someone's bleeding. 
So, uh, this goes down descending order. Eight, you can't find your cell phone, so you have a friend call you and run around the house till you find it in the bottom of the downstairs laundry basket. Seven, you spend an entire week wearing sweats. Six, your definition of a good day is surviving 24 hours without a child leaking bodily fluids on you. Five, popsicles have become a food staple. Four, your favorite TV show is a cartoon. Three, you're willing to kiss your child's boo-boo no matter where it is. Two, spit is your number one cleaning agent. <laughs> and number one, you're so desperate for adult conversation that you spill your guts to a telemarketer. So, <laughs> <laughs> goes back to where we started today with the telemarketers. But uh, anyway, uh, when you look at you know, the frustrations that people just naturally have, it is easy to say, well, come on. That doesn't have to necessarily be related to pride. But uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, no matter what circumstances we're in, we have to respond to those. And our response is going to determine, um, you know, what the long-range consequences will be. And the more pride we have, the more likely we will respond in frustration. And, you know, anger, frustration, these things tend to go together. And um, basically, pride, anger, and frustration are interconnected if you will, according to the Bible. And uh, we don't want to imply that, uh, you know, there are circumstances that are just so frustrating that we have no choice but to respond with frustration. Obviously, there, there are times in life when we're just trying to survive. I was just telling, talking to a couple about that recently. You know, hey, this is a time of life where you just hope to survive, you know? We're not talking about thriving here, we're just talking about trying to survive. And uh, I think of Wesley, you know, John Wesley's mom, Susanna. She had 19 kids, believe it or not. 19 kids. And yet every single day, she would pull her apron up over her head for an entire hour and just listen to God and pray. Uh, right in the middle of the day. The kids knew it. They knew they weren't to bother her. Uh, I don't know what they did during that hour, but uh, it must have been something good because she turned out some of the greatest kids the world has ever known. John and Charles, foremost among them. But, um, you know, I, I got that from uh, Dick Eastman's book, The Hour That Changes the World. And, uh, you know, one hour can make all the difference in the world, as it did for Susanna Wesley. But um, when we talk about, you know, things are not how I want them to be, so it's terrible, that's what we call catastrophizing thinking, or stinking thinking. Albert Ellis uh, often uses this phrase in his rational emotive therapy. And uh, there, there are five steps to it, A, B, C, D, E. And the A is the activating event. We all have some activating event that sets us off. Uh, B is our belief system. That, that's the key component. What is your belief system in terms of how you're going to respond to this activating event? C is the consequence of that belief system. D is what he calls disputing. That's where the counselor tries to dispute unhealthy belief systems and convert them into healthy belief systems. And then E is the new effect that is created by a healthy belief system. The interesting thing about Ellis is that he has very biblical principles to his theory, even though he's a total atheist and makes fun of Christians in the Bible all the time. It's just very interesting to me that uh, you know, this guy can't stand Christianity, he can't stand the Bible, and yet when you look at the principles of so much of what he teaches, they're just right in scripture. You can just go right to text and, and pull them out. So he's got his own pride issues. But, um, you know, a healthy belief system 
is ultimately based on the word of God. It's based on the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20. All the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. So the more we can fill our minds with those promises, the more we can meditate on those promises, the more we can claim those promises, the more we can apply those promises in the ups and downs and difficult circumstances that we face in life, the better we are. And, um, you know, the need to be right makes it very difficult for us to extend grace or to receive grace. And that's the rest of this text. It's a very interesting text. First it says, God frustrates. <laughs> you know, God. Does that mean God's just saying, oh, Steve, you're a little prideful today. I'm going to really frustrate you. No, I don't think that's what it's saying. I think it's saying that God sets laws in motion. God sets principles in motion that have natural consequences. And when we respond in pride to things, when we have pride in our hearts, we will have a natural response of frustration. Frustration and pride go together. They're largely inseparable. The more proud we are, the more frustrated we get when things don't go our way, when we don't get proven right, when things aren't how we want them to be. So it's not God prodding us, it's God having a, a universe with principles that will play out in our lives and, and those consequences will ring true. If we choose pride, we will experience frustration. But it says he gives grace, gives more grace, he gives grace to everyone or we wouldn't be alive, but he gives more grace to whom? The humble. We already talked about what humility is, recognizing everything good comes from God that whatever gifts he's given us, they're to be used to his glory and not our own. Uh, there's a great little book that I finished recently called Unleashing the Force of Favor, talking about grace and favor in our lives. And um, what I really liked about this is that uh, their spiritual authors, totally coming from a completely spiritual perspective, but they're also very practical. Um, and they do a lot of um, applying spiritual principles through exercise. They, they both uh, compete in Ironman competitions and this kind of stuff. So both husband and wife exercise on a regular daily basis, an hour, two hours a day. And, um, and they apply the principles of exercise and muscles and building up your body to your, your spiritual life. And uh, there, there's so much truth in that, really. You know, if, if you want your muscles to build up, what do you have to do? You have to be consistent. You have to make it a daily habit. You know, it's not a formula. One of the things he likes to say in the book is, faith is not a formula. Favor is not a formula. But it is based on spiritual habits. And he talks a lot about spiritual habits. And we all understand how habits make sense physically. You know, if, if I don't exercise for three weeks and then I think I'm going to go out and run three miles hard, I'm a moron. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay a huge price for that. Uh, you have to be consistent. You have to gradually build muscles up. And you have to be sensitive to those muscles and how they're functioning, how they're operating, you know. And, um, the same is true spiritually, you know, and, and he talks about spending, we should all spend at least an hour a day um, building up our bodies as the temples of God, taking care of our bodies the way God wants us to. That we should spend an hour a day in family things, making sure we're connected with family. And then he has three other hours that are very interesting. He says, one, I like to spend an hour of study broadening my mind, and many, usually reading spiritual authors, but also other authors, knowing what's going on in the world, being informed, developing my mind. And then the last two are an hour in prayer and an hour in the Word. And uh, that's a lot. You know, you say, wow, five hours a day, how can you possibly do that? And most people say, oh, I'm way too busy to even think about five hours a day. 
but the average American's watching seven hours of TV a day. Uh, that's, the, <laughs> that's the average. And so uh, even many of us might be watching five hours of TV a day, but we're saying, oh, no, this is impossible. That, that's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. Um, you know, it's a matter of priorities. And uh, he's saying that God's favor and grace will flow as we choose these principles of humility, of love, of relationship, and putting first things first. And so I encourage you to uh, think about this. One other book I'll just mention today is Bob Pitts uh, loaned me this book, Transforming Your Business which uh, he, he just really felt the Spirit of God told him to give me this. And um, I'm going to have Pam copy some pages out of this for me. Uh, I'm going to leave it with you because uh, he's going to pick it up from you. I'm, I'm going to be going, yeah, you can read as, <laughs> read as much as you want until he picks it up. But one of the things that really struck me about that book was by business, he just means whatever organization or whatever church or whatever you belong to. And I've never seen a book that goes into principalities and powers and the strong men and the, the things that are connected to undermining organizations and structures the way he does in this book. It's just quite fascinating to me. And um, one of the things I got convicted as I was reading it was we need to have more prayer time in our staff. Sometimes we just end up babbling in staff. and You know, don't spend time in concerted prayer. And I, I really believe that prayer is absolutely key and, and, and important. And we need to be doing that in staff and in, in all of our gatherings. That prayer is just such a powerful thing and understanding what we're up against and understanding the roots of systems. That's one of the things that really struck me. I was talking about the roots of Adventism earlier. Well, he talks about how strongholds are connected to the founders, uh, to the leaders, to every organization you can look at, you know, there, there are strongholds that get in there and they have to be repented of, they have to be prayed over, they have to be uh, moved out uh, in order for the organization to really be blessed. And so that's something I want us to pray over and be talking about in our staff because I found the book to be very, very powerful. But uh, as we close this morning, you know, I would say that the average American, a lot of studies have been done on this, who is asked, uh, do you think you'll go to heaven, says yes. The great majority say yes. And when they're asked why, uh, the normal answer is, because I'm a pretty good person, or I'm better than most people. You know, it's a comparative thing. And uh, the idea being, oh, I'm pretty good. And, uh, you know, Matthew 19:17 says there's only one who's good. There's only one who's righteous. There's only one who's right. And that's God. And as we think about the spirit of pride, it wants to undermine our understanding of that truth. It wants to get in the way of our thinking so that we think that we're right and that we're righteous somehow apart from Christ. And... Um, so, you know, as we close this morning, I just want to say that uh, love and humility are the answer to the spirit of pride. And uh, those who have found love and who have found humility as primary focuses through Christ will have died to pride. <laughs>